It's so good to see your faces. Man, I just believe that uh, God's got a word for you. And uh, I think there's nothing better than a word in season. Sometimes you receive a word or an encouragement, something that speaks to your heart, but doesn't really, the, the truth of it doesn't set in motion in the time that you're in. But I'm really hoping and praying that today's word uh, is going to speak to your heart. It's going to encourage you and hopefully give you some tools that you need in the time that you're in. And so, and I'm just so grateful to be sharing God's word with you this morning. And, and just, it's been stirring in my heart all week. Been so excited to share with you and just felt led and compelled to tell you this morning, man, God hasn't brought you this far for you to stop. That there's always more to dig into into the things of God, into the Word of God, into the presence of God. There's always more to dig into in our faith, that we've never actually arrived until we heard the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And there's so much more in you, wherever you're at on your journey today. I know sometimes it can be overwhelming, the weight of the world, the weight of life can, and it can, it can be a toil sometimes. <laughs> Some of the situations that we find ourselves in, the circumstances can be crippling. God wants you to know by the power of the Spirit, by the truth of His Word, that He doesn't want to just impart to you salvation, but He also wants to empower you to live the life that He's called you to live. And so this morning, I, I thought it would be helpful for us as a church to maybe go backwards a little bit. In fact, I want us to go so back, back to the beginning back to the inception of the church in Acts chapter 2, we're going to find ourselves today. But I just think, and sometimes in order to go forward, you need to go back sometimes. There's a sweetness that you can find in the beginning. There are things that you can learn about the truth of how God spoke to the church and how God lit the flame and the fire of the gospel and his kingdom that he wants to establish here on this earth and how he commissioned his followers during this time and what he did to us. not only equip us to mold us into his likeness so that we could be used for his kingdom. And so today we're going to look at um, Acts chapter 2. I want to do a scripture reading and then we'll pray and get into some handles. Sound good? All right. We're going to find ourselves, should be on the screen. But if you have a Bible, you can open that up too. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. The Word of God says this, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and, and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus. We just thank you for the power of your word. We thank you that you're here this morning. I pray that you would just impart something to us today. But we, I pray just against any, just feeling of just going through the motions, whether it's in our faith or in church. And I pray that you would just spark something inside of us today, that we would use that as a fresh wind to go into our week, to give us the courage we need to face the problems that we're dealing with. We love you so much, Lord. We praise you. And all God's people said, amen, amen. So good. Man, at the conception of the church, one thing was for sure. They were devoted. <laughs> they were willing to lay it all down for the sake of the gospel. It's so clear that Jesus used the people that he did in the time that he did it for so many reasons. 
But one of them, I believe, is to display his magnificent glory and to teach us and show us, man, if I could, if God can use these people to build his church, he can use anybody. He can use anybody. And one thing was, was for sure, they were devoted. But what you have to understand about devotion is that devotion is always deeply connected to desire. What you're devoted to is cultivated by your desires. And intention, while powerful, is meaningless without devotion and direction. So your direction and what you're devoted to is actually the activation of your intentions. And it's those very things that come to life and bring forth the fruit of your life. And so when we look at the early disciples and Christians, we see that they were devoted and they weren't just they didn't just have the intention of following Jesus. They brought those intentions to life and they sparked their faith. And what happened was a whole revival was broken out. And, and this ragtag group of disciples, uneducated men and women, fishermen, tax collectors, just normal everyday people, started a movement that would change the trajectory of humanity. They didn't do it alone. They did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they had not just intentions, but they activated their intentions and they were devoted. And so this morning, I want to talk to you today about the DNA of devotion. What does the DNA of devotion look like? What does the DNA of the early church look like? What can we glean from? What can we learn from these people? and take into our own personal lives and into our community and, and, and see how we can actually transform how we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the, the DNA it, it is so important to see because this is what determines how you function and how you flourish. And so the, the components that we're going to talk about today aren't something to just take lightly can't take it lightly. I think that this is the, these are the very foundations of which I believe God was building his church on. And how many of you know that the foundation is one of the most important parts of any structure? Doesn't matter how tall you want to build it, how strong you want to make it appear, or how beautiful the outside is. If the foundation isn't secure, if the foundation isn't strong, everything's going to fall. And so the first DNA part and component of devotion that I want to talk to you today about is doctrine. So to the early church, doctrine was foundation. Doctrine was essential. It says in the scripture in verse 42 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. What you need to understand is that, that the apostles' teaching was the, the, the foundation for understanding and living out the Christian faith. That good doctrine is actually the very thing that prevents us from misunderstanding God's purposes and desires for humanity and for our lives. And so why is this important contextually? Because history and orthodoxy tells us what our foundation is, but our culture is in a, in, in a bit of a crossroads when it comes to Christianity, orthodoxy, history, tradition, and God's purposes versus a culture that wants to not only deconstruct, but rip apart the foundations and replace them with new ones. So we live in what many would call the age of ideology starting in the 20th century where all of these new sciences and discoveries and ideologies and philosophies started to integrate themselves into society and seep its way into the church. And over time, what we have begun to see is that it's actually started to degrade our foundations, where people are leaving in droves from the church. People are confused about who God is. They're confused about their identity. They're confused about what the meaning of life is. And, and much of this is due because of these destructive ideologies, one of them being just the movement of individualism into the church. And so the problem is, is that we have so many people that want to call their own shots and they want to be their, their own authority on their life. 
but the early Christians understood in order for me to flourish, in order for me to be in God's will, I have to be under authority. We have to be under God's, God's word. We have to be under God's teaching. And, and the problem is we have so many people that, that not only want to abandon that, but they want to call their own shots. And what they come to find is that actually on the other side of that decision is chaos. <laughs> It's absolute chaos. We see this in our world today. We see the chaos that it's brought in our churches. We've seen the chaos that's brought into our cities. We see the chaos that is brought to our this this generation of people. And what God wants to do is He wants to ground you in His Word and His commandments, and for you to understand that the lie that living under His authority is actually going to constrict you. It's not going to constrict you. It's going to free you from your worst enemy, you. So God wants to help you today to understand that good biblical teaching and good understanding of God's word and his commandment is actually foundational for your life. It's important. It's so important. The Bible and good teaching is so important that the early Christians died for it. They painstakingly, they, 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 they brought everything that they were into moving this forward. And, and in the early church, they painstakingly copied the Bible by hand with scribes and monasteries preserving ancient manuscripts throughout generations. That the Bible that we have today is actually a miracle in and of itself, if you know that. That, that if you actually were able to look at how the Bible was was preserved and kept over time and the consistency that we see in the early manuscripts and how seriously the early church took the word of god we have such an opposite perception today we, we treat the bible so casually we treat doctrine so conveniently we want to fit it into our own mold and our own comfort zone but our comfort zone is actually the place where we actually start to hurt ourselves. And so, man, I just think we have this colossal problem on our hands as an American church especially. This, this is in particular a problem in the American church. And, and you could even just kind of break it down a little bit, and I'll do that for you. Is that when we talk about the Bible, many people might proclaim or project and say that oh yeah i know the bible and uh, they understand some some foundational scripture theology and basis for who christ is but here's the kicker this is interesting a survey show that a whopping 82 percent of americans believe that the quote god helps those who help themselves is straight from the bible <laughs> newsflash it's not <laughs> 12% of the population thinks Joan of Arc scored the role of Noah's wife. <laughs> Boy, all right. So, and you got 50% of high school grads thinking Sodom and Gomorrah were the ultimate power couple. If anyone knows the story, they were not. <laughs> so, yes, this struggle is real. There are so many misconceptions that are floating around about what the, what the Bible says about our lives. And we have a generation that is wandering and wondering and seeking and looking and trying to understand what truth is. And they say that they're spiritual, but they don't have an understanding and they don't have spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear what God is saying to them through the power and the truth of his word. I love this. A study was shared with me this past week. I don't think we have the graphic for this, but listen closely. This is powerful for those of you that maybe are struggling with, maybe it's just whether it's reading God's word or meditating on the truths that you find in scripture on a daily or weekly basis. This should challenge you and encourage you. Listen to this. Studies have shown that when the Bible is read at least four times per week, feelings of loneliness drop 30%. Anger issues drop 32%. Relationship problems drop 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Viewing porn drops 61%. And get this, sharing your faith jumps 200%. I 
something that happens when you submit yourself under the authority and the power of God's word and its transformation. God wants to speak to you today. And it's not through some cloud or some random. We have access to God's words on a daily basis. And when we make good doctrine and, and God's truth the foundation for our lives, it changes everything in who we are. And so the first component of, of the DNA of devotion is having this foundation. But the second one is this. And this is just as important, is prayer was pivotal. Prayer was pivotal to the early church. You could almost trace every single miracle and big move of God in the book of Acts. You just go read the story. And almost every miracle was preceded by a prayer meeting. Almost every moment where God does something great in the church, it's preceded by people who are committed to prayer. How many of y'all know that prayer changes things? And if it doesn't change your situation or your circumstance, I'll tell you what it will change. It's going to change you. And so prayer was pivotal. I love this quote by St. Ephraim. He was a prominent Christian theologian and poet who lived in the 4th century. I think this quote reigns true today. He says this, so beautiful. Prayer is the delight of the joyful, the solace of the afflicted, the banquet of the hungry, the grace of the repentant, the strength of the weak, the safeguard of the strong. Prayer is the wellspring of virtues, the destroyer of evil, the preserver of good. It is the channel through which grace flows, the ladder that ascends to heaven, Prayer is mightier than kingship, more powerful than armies, more magnificent than monuments, more glorious than thrones. Prayer is powerful. Prayer shifts the temperature in the room and it shifts the, the tune and the tone of our hearts. And it's prayer is the act of exchanging our will and our desires for God's. And this is why Jesus, when, when the disciples, and I love this about the disciples when they were walking with Jesus, is that what you need to understand is that the disciples, they had already known how to pray. They had heaps of scripture memorized from the Pentateuch, from the Old Testament. They knew what it was like to pray in the temple. And yet, under Jesus' teaching, they asked him the question, Lord, teach us how to pray. And one of the aspects of the Lord's Prayer, he teaches them how to ask for God's will, right? And so the, the, the prayer is, is the act of asking God's will to come into our hearts, to come into our lives, and for us to get in alignment with God's purposes. Prayer gets us in alignment with God's purpose for our life. Imagine a driving a car that is out of alignment over a certain period of time. What's going to happen? It's going to break down. There's going to be mechanical issues. There's going to be problems on the road. The tires are going to wear out. You can only go so far without getting aligned. It's the same way with your soul. It's the same way with your spirit and your heart. Is that prayer is an activation of our faith to God. So even when I don't feel it, even when I'm tired, I'm going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to go to a place where I could seek you. God, I'm going to just, I'm going to lay down my burdens to you. I'm going to ask you for what I need in this life and, and, and for you to fulfill my heart's desires, God, and, and help me get in alignment with who you are. Prayer is soul care maintenance. You need to get in alignment, my friends. I have to get in alignment. Because if I don't, I'll start walking funny. <laughs> if I'm not in alignment with God, you can tell. <laughs> you can always tell when it's been a minute since I've talked to God. Or if, I, if I'm if i not prioritizing prayer. And, 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 and these what starts to happen to your soul when you're not connecting with God is there are these leaks that happen in your heart. And these leaks kind of pour out into your life and you end up actually bleeding on other people and you end up 
that you end up having outbursts of anger or you say something that you didn't mean to say or or you just end up doing the exact opposite of what you really desire to do but since you're not in step with the spirit and in alignment with god's will you start to leave <laughs> i love this in matthew chapter 7 verse 7 jesus tells a crowd of people he says ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be open to you see a lot of people don't pray because they think that god won't answer their prayers and maybe you've been struggling yourself to have the faith that you need to believe god for the very answer for your prayer that you're desiring but what jesus wants us to learn when we pray is that prayer isn't just for ourself and our soul care but it's actually for the benefit of other people too and to get not just get in alignment with them but to have the courage and the faith to go you know what i could actually go to my father in heaven and he doesn't want to just decline my request every time that actually cares about your desires he cares about the very things that you care about but what good father doesn't love giving gifts to his children ask him seek him and you'll find not some of you haven't seen or scratched the surface of what god wants to do in your life or in your world or in your family just because you haven't asked him god desires to help you god desires to heal you and and, and to show you his desire and will for your life and so i want to encourage you today and maybe maybe you're you're a person that would define yourself as man i just i pray when i feel like it but you want to become a person that has prayer as a part of your daily rhythms of your life. Prayer has to be an integral part of who you are. And, and prayer is just a fancy word for talking to God. It's not complicated. We, we, sometimes we can think that it's more spiritual than it is. If you need to say it out loud, if you need to just pray it in your heart or write it down, that helps me too. Do whatever you can, but to make it a part of your daily rhythms and what you'll come to find is that when you start with structure it turns into more it turns into spontaneous so you begin with the structure you say okay lord i'm going to devote this time because we're talking about devotion i'm going to start and lay down this time of my day to you and i'm going to make this a part of my rhythm i'm going to make this a part of my routine and what you'll come to see is that god will start inserting himself the holy spirit will start urging you and tugging your heart throughout the day and so we don't just talk to God in a moment, but he's actually wanting to walk with us through every moment, every conversation, every phone call, every commute, every morning when we, when we, when we plant our two feet on the ground for the first time, God is with us. He's with us. And he wants to interact with us. So prayer is pivotal and devotion and, 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 and mirroring ourselves as the early church did are y'all still with me? We're still rolling. The next component is this. I think this is going to challenge some people. But it's that close and continual community was vital. It was vital. It said in the scripture that all who believed were together and had all things in common. And later on in Acts chapter 4, he says this. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. See, in the early church, there's a misconception that, you know, they all they did, all that they did was that they met house churches and hung out and had dinner they actually were in the temple every single day they were doing church every day they were gathering together they, the community wasn't just something of convenience it was a part of the fabric of who they were and so why is this important because in isolation is when you actually set up a trap for yourself and god wants to keep you in community and not just in community but to keep it consistent and continual because that is the very thing that protects us and keeps us in step with what god has for us 
And the truth is that we, what we find in this example of, of the early church is that united we stand and divided we fall. This was a non-negotiable for these people. They understood the necessity of being together. And not only that, but they had a radical sense of what generosity meant. So they weren't just near each other in proximity, but disconnected. They were close and connected. So much so that when somebody needed something, they would sell what they had so that they could give and provide to the needs of the people around them in their community. They understood the necessity of charity and, 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 and extending their resources and saying like, whatever you need, I've got it. This is radical way of living that's so the opposite of how we have functioned or thought about how church is to be done. It's like, you do your thing, and we have our cliques, or we have these groups of people, and then only certain people are allowed into the circle. And, and this was not a concept that they had in this time. It's all who believe were together and united. And so in a time where we live, where people are isolated, and they're comfortable in their isolation, I think this is one of the greatest oppositions to the power of the church in this time is, is the culture of isolation that we've set. Because you can be in close proximity with people, but not in personal relationship. How many of you know that? That you could be around people, but for them to not know you personally enough to know the burdens that you have so that they can carry your burdens and show you Jesus in your life. And my hope and my prayer is not just for our church, but the global church, and, and for especially the church in America to come to the place where we're people who lay down our lives for one another. That we don't just say that we're going to carry your burdens, but we actually show up and show out in each other's lives. That we don't just say, hey, I'm going to pray for you, but we actually pray for them right there. Like We actually show up into people's lives and become interconnected in a way that is powerful. This unity is what will, de what will determine your longevity. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 12 says this. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. What you need to understand is that at one point, if you're divided or disoriented in your community, it's all going to break at some point. And so we're better together. We're better united. We're better as people that, that, that don't want to compromise our community. And so we, 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 we shy away from anything that would divide us, whether it's gossip, whether it's anger, anger or bitterness or resentment. And we lay down our lives as a living sacrifice for not just the sake of the gospel, but for the sake and the goodness of the people around us. And so community was continual, it was vital to the vibrancy of the early church. And the next one is this, I love this, this just gets me excited, is that praise was imperative for early Christians. Praise was imperative. It said that they had gladness in their hearts. That, that Gladness is the very thing and gratitude are the very things that precede the praising in our life. They were meeting every day in the temple. They were worshiping together. They were praying together. They were seeking the things of God. And Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says this, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God need to understand that gratitude and praise are deeply, deeply connected. Is that in worship, gratitude fuels our praise. And, and, and when we don't have praise as a result in your life, because you know that praise is just the result. It's the result of having, it's a response from having this view of God and this view and gratitude of, in our hearts and thankfulness in our hearts where there's I got nothing else to do but lift up my hands. I got nothing left to do but to just sing a song of praise. I've got nothing else that I can do because I'm so grateful that God saved me. I'm so grateful that God came down to humanity and touched our hearts and brought humanity back to God. 
I can't help but praise. Praise was imperative. Praise was important. Praise was a part of the foundation of the early church. And man, I just, I know so, so many people, I think they get a little twisted. I don't think they realize that we're going to spend eternity praising God. Why don't we just start a little early here in church sometimes? It's like, well, I'm just going to wait till we get to heaven. Why would I wait to get to heaven to praise God for all of eternity when we can praise him here today? And listen to me, you can praise God not just in church. You can praise him in your car. You can praise him in your shower. You can praise him in your home. It doesn't matter where you're at. If you got a heart that's full of gladness, you can praise the Lord anywhere. How many of y'all know that today? It doesn't matter where you are. The Spirit of God follows you. And the Spirit of praise always, always is rooted in gratitude. And so if you're not seeing the fruit of praising your life, it doesn't mean that you're not a good enough Christian. It doesn't mean that you don't care enough about singing to God. What it might mean is that you have a sense or a lack of gratitude in your heart. Or you're unwilling to come face to face with the fact that maybe you're more concerned about the approval of other people than you are about being approved by God. And so praise is the, is, is the physical act of a spiritual response and a reaction in our hearts to go, I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what people think. I've been approved by God. I'm living for his approval. And I'm just living with reckless abandon towards who he is. It's important. It's not just an act. It's a reflection of the status of our hearts. You see, in ancient culture, uh, if a peasant ever had the odd chance in the world to be in the court of a king, there was a sense of humility. There was a sense of reverence. There was a sense of I cannot believe I'm in the house of the king. I cannot believe that I'm in the room. I cannot believe that I just got access. I'm just a mere peasant and I'm in the court and I cannot believe that I'm here and I need to give him the honor that's due. I need to give him the reverence that's due. But how many of you know that you've been given as a child of God access into the king of the universe's house, that you have access into his room. And so it warrants a response, not just from our hearts, not to just keep inside, but to actually give him praise, to actually give a reverent heart to the Lord. And it, it warrants a response. Your posture says a lot. Your posture says a lot about where you're at. And so man, I just want to encourage you today. Wherever you're at, man, this, I can't say this enough. This goes so far beyond the walls of the church. Praise. It's not just when we're singing on Sunday anymore. It's, it's in the, it could be in the rhythms of your day. And so I hope that that not only encourages you, but actually convicts you enough to say, man, maybe this is the weapon that I need to fight against the bitterness that I've been facing or the hard heart that I've been dealing with in my own person. God wants to free you from that. And part of that can be the power of praise. And the last strand of DNA, component of DNA of devotion is this. Is that favor is my favorite one. Favor followed them. Favor followed them. It says in verse 47 that they had favor with all the people, people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Can y'all do me just a favor, really quickly? Can you just look to the person next to you? Just let them know you got favor. You could look him dead in the eye. You could point at him. You let him know you got favor. <laughs> what was exceptional about the early church? Was it that they were smart and esteemed and educated, or? had this sense of notoriety that gained them traction and, and then thus spurred off this huge movement. It doesn't mean that, favor doesn't mean that they had charisma. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they already had a good following and 
that they, they knew how to speak eloquently. No, no, no. It meant that they were marked by God. That they had the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which only comes through belief in Jesus Christ, which comes when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he wasn't just a prophet, but he was actually the Son of God, sent to seek and save humanity and reconcile humanity back to God. And not just reconcile them back to God, but to actually give you the right relationship and the empowerment from the Father to have the Holy Spirit mark you in this life. Your favor doesn't come from the world your favor doesn't come from your charisma it doesn't come from the perception of other people your favor comes from your father and so God wants you to know today the power that you need to live in the calling of God in your life only can come from his Holy Spirit it says this this is I just love this Acts chapter 4 verse 13 when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men they were astonished <laughs> and they recognized that they had been with Jesus <laughs> would people recognize today that you have been with Jesus when people see your life would they wonder where does that come from who is this person what is it about who you are that sets you apart from the world favor followed them now, listen to me very closely. Favor followed them because they followed him. Favor followed them because they followed him. They followed the king. They laid down their life for the king. And he leaves you changed. I remember it was so funny. This last week, I was having a lunch with a friend. And we were walking around the area. And I told him I was going to preach this after it happened. So... And he's in the room. I'm not going to point or look at him. But we were walking around. And we had just had lunch. And we walk into this other store. And the gentleman at the front looks at my friend. And he goes, excuse me, sir. You know you're holding a glass cup, right? And he had taken the cup and was just, we had been walking around the area without even knowing it fully with a glass cup in his hand. And I didn't even notice it really, to be honest with you, because we were just walking and talking. But we found ourselves in the store and this gentleman was so perplexed, he was so confused. He looks at him and he goes, the first thing he says, he goes, excuse me, sir. You know you're holding a, where did you get that cup? <laughs> and he goes, oh, I didn't even realize. And I looked at him because I was, what, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> and what you need to understand today is that when you, have the Holy Spirit in your life, you will carry something that other people will see and ask you, excuse me, miss, excuse me, sir, where did you get that from? Where did you, how, where does this come from? And what you come to see is that when you're actually walking in alignment with the Spirit, when you're allowing for the Holy Spirit to just, it's a part of who I am. Sometimes I don't even fully know it, but I know that the Holy Spirit is with me. And people start to notice. People will start to ask questions in your life. It's like, man, how is it that your family is like this? How is it that you talk this way to these people? How, did you, how is it that you treat these people in this situation in this way? What is it that sets you apart? Favor can only come from a Holy Spirit anointing in your life. What you got to know about the church is the actual meaning of the of the Greek of the church means actually called out an assembly of people that was called out from God so God chose you if you have faith in your heart and the Holy Spirit's leading your life that God you need to know that if you're a part of this church if you're a part of of the body of believers that God has set you apart for a purpose and he called you and he put, he took you out of darkness into light so that you would be a light to the world. He's called you out and he's purposed you for the time that, you, that you're in today for a reason. And so what you need to know is that you can't have favor without stepping out in faith first. Do you have faith in Jesus? Do you have daily active laying down my life for who Jesus is in your hardware and who you are as a person. I love this about who we are as believers is that 
in, in John chapter 14, and I'll, and I'll just close with this thought and invite the team up, is that Thomas said to Jesus, he goes, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus tells him in response, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the destination. And so I'm not devoted to a bottom line. I'm not devoted to trying to make my own desires or dreams happen. I am following the way and showing other people the way. And the way is through Jesus. The way is through trusting him and relying on who he is. And Jesus has called you out to not just be a bystander in this world, but Jesus actually taught us as, and is imploring you today to not just be a, a casual Christian, but actually to be a light of the world he said you are the light of the world you are the light of the world and and when one doesn't light a lamp and put it under a bowl he said no 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 you actually put it on the stand so that everybody in the room can be see can see the light it's so beautiful that when you're living in alignment with God in devotion to God what happens is the light of Christ comes into your heart enlivens you and breathes life and light into the room to the world around you do you change the temperature of the room that you're in you could carry your own weather into a room only you knew the capacity that god has for you you are the light of the world my friends he promised us that he will build his church and upon this rock the gates of hell will not withstand. There's nothing that can be against us. There's nothing that can stand against the power of our God. When we're living in light of the power of who Jesus is, there's nothing that can stop the church. Do you believe that today, my friends? And I just, I really believe that God's going to stir something new inside of us. That if we were able to just submit ourselves in humility to God's authority and who he is, to walk step by step in his spirit, to go back to the beginning and the beauty of what God has for his church. He's not done with us yet, my friends. There's more work to do. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few. God's got more for us in this season. He's got more for us in this time. And this is a great hour in which we live in, in our world and humanity and in our country going to need the church to rise up are you willing to accept that challenge to be a light in darkness to not be afraid to expose darkness but to on our journey to heaven to grab people along the way say no this is the way this is the way jesus is the way jesus is the way and the truth and the life are you willing to look at your neighbor the people in your circle and to grab them along the journey and say listen i've been following with jesus and jesus transformed my whole life this is the testimony and the power of the church is that it's not perfect people projecting a perfect God. It's imperfect people showing the way to a perfect, sinless God who, who came to bring us life and life abundantly, my friends. The life in Jesus is not a, a life that is lame or one that is just like, oh, these are lame Christians or this is just, they're, they're legalistic. No, no, no. This is life and life abundantly. The best life is the life of Jesus. Do you believe that? Then I encourage you to share that life with your friends, your family, your circle. And may we become people that don't just say that we're devoted, but we actually have in our hearts and in our DNA the devotion that God has called us to have in this time. Let's pray together. Jesus, we're so grateful. Thank you for setting a path for us. Thank you for being patient with us, even when we are in our own mess and we're feeling sorry for ourselves. We don't know what to do next, God. Life can be 
confusing. And I just pray for anyone today that's struggling with their calling, they're struggling with their place in this world. Maybe they're lacking the courage they need to be a light in the time that they're living in. I pray, God, that you would just impart courage today. Father, I pray that you would use us, Lord. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray all, all these things in you. All God's people said, Amen. You can stand. Let's worship together.